Good afternoon from warm and humid Singapore, and welcome back to our Bridging the Gulf Public Education series hosted by the Middle East Institute Singapore. Today we enter episode seven of the series, and we've so far have done quite a number of country-specific episodes, the last one being on the UAE, and before that, Oman. So today our episode number seven will focus on Qatar, and the title of today's webinar is Qatar, small state, big politics, and the road to diversification. So today I'm very pleased to welcome two distinguished speakers, Ms. Zakar Khabez and Mr. Omran Hamad Akuari, who will join us later on shortly after my brief introduction. So let me now share my slides to, to kick off the webinar. So because our speakers will be covering the political and economic aspects of Qatar, I will begin and probably complement their presentations with the cultural phase and how soft power is projected through cultural aspects. So the cultural phase of Qatar really, if you want to look at the latest news, it's, it was nominated as the capital of culture in the Islamic world of 2021 by the Islamic World Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. So this will, this will kick off a year long, uh, a series of year long events, which were, which were announced in March this year under this program, which will comprise uh, exhibitions, festivals, and the slogan for this program is our culture is enlightenment. So part of the program also includes um, you know, virtual tours of museums, and of course the Katara cultural village. So as you can see on your slide here, uh, this is the, these are some photos of the Museum of Islamic Art in, 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 in Qatar. And if you haven't visited, of course, now we are, we are all caught up in, in a bit of restrictions due to the pandemic. But at some point, I think you should visit this museum. Uh, part of the cultural projection by Qatar also includes an exchange program between countries. And so far, it started since 2012. And, and lasted up to now. Uh, the years of cultural program this year and, and the theme for this year is Qatar USA 2021, which, 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 is a, which is an end product of the strategic dialogue between the two countries last September. So this is the kind of um, exchange programs initiated by Qatar Museum since 2012. And, and this is still ongoing. In terms of fashion and art, uh, you know, um, if you saw the last slide, which is uh, this is the National Museum of Qatar. The opening party for the National Museum was in 2019 March, where there were invitations by the ruling Al Thani family for celebrities to come and, and grace the event at that time, including uh, celebrities such as uh, Victoria Beckham, Car Carla Bruni, for example. And the investments by Qatar in, in the area of fashion art, luxury, and, and sports really is about uh, winning hearts and minds, uh, forging partnerships that provide uh, outside players with uh, uh, opportunities for collaboration and cooperation, also shoring up the whole soft power aspect. So, so if you look at both the art world and, and the fashion uh, aspects of, of Qatar's project, projection of soft power, we see also personalities linked to the ruling family, such as uh, Sheikh Mayasa Athani, um, who is the sister of the Emir and also has, has huge art acquisitions val you know, valued up to one billion a year. And she's also the chair of the Qatar Museums. And also we see in, in the fashion uh, domain, we see um, another um, firm called the May Mehula for investments, which is also linked to the mother of the Emir, Sheikh Hamoza uh, Misnet, who also founded the Fashion Trust Arabia. Uh, that 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 also is uh, you know um, that also is linked to big luxury brands such as Valentino and Balmain. Other stakes by by Qatar include um, PSG, the football club, Paris Saint Germain, and also a twenty percent stake in in London's uh, Heathrow Airport. So this is the kind of uh, reach that that Qatar has played you know um, as an international uh, player. And, and but this will be covered of course more by our speakers. And finally, I want to touch on uh, education as another key aspect because um, since um, 
1997, Education City was was um, uh, um, vision as 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 a transition towards a knowledge based economy as part of the Qatar National Vision 2030. Education City now in Qatar uh, has a branch campus. Uh, it's, it's a branch campus model with nine universities, of which six uh, are, are American universities, one uh, British, one French, and one local university in the Hamad bin Khalifa uh, University. So this is a kind of high expenditure by, by Qatar Foundation in terms of uh, developing human capital. Of course, the challenges still persist uh, in terms of uh, you know, educating uh, Qatari nationals because of the, the discrepancies and the disparities between, uh, in, in terms of the numbers between the nationals and the foreign expat population, but also the skill set. Um, but we've also seen a shift in language policy. We've seen uh, previously that whole K-12 um, curriculum, K-12 meaning the equivalent of Singapore's uh, primary and secondary education was in Arabic before traditionally, but has now shifted gradually towards uh, English as a medium of instruction. And finally, last point was on the slide is uh, Qatar National Library is digitizing both. It has worked for quite, an, quite a significant amount of time with uh, the British Library to digitize the India office records, of course, very important for us researchers. And more recently, just uh, three days ago, I think uh, uh, more MOUs signed with Russian institutions notably uh, the Peter the Great Museum of Anthropology and Ethnography, and also St. Petersburg Museum uh, to, to digitize their own historical photography records. So that's the kind of um, multifaceted approach that Qatar has played uh, in terms of its uh, role on the international arena. But now I would like to introduce our speakers who will of course be covering uh, the aspects more in depth and more significantly uh, especially the political and economic aspects. So please allow me to introduce first Ms. Zakara Parves, who is a PhD candidate at Durham University. And until December 2020, she was also a lecturer at the Middle East Department at Hamad bin Khalifa University. And her previous degrees, her BA and MSc, were at Georgetown University and SOAS, respectively. Um, and also she has also, in, you know, she was involved in past research initiatives, including gender issues in Saudi Arabia, and also the development of youth and education in Qatar. She's also a regular contributor to Middle East Monitor. Our second speaker for today is Mr. Omran Hamad Akwari, who is the CEO of Qatar Foundation International and also a doctoral researcher at the UCL's Institute for Sustainable Resources. He has previously held leadership positions in the energy sector as as uh, between 1999 and 2015, including Qatar Petroleum, ExxonMobil, Green Gulf, South Coke Gas, and these, these positions were across uh, different countries such as the UK, Japan, and the Middle East. So he's, Mr. Omran also sits on several boards, including Qatar Development Fund and Carnegie Mellon University, Qatar. His doctoral research revolves around climate change, decarbonization, with a specific focus on hydrogen and liquefied natural gas LNG. So without further ado, and after my brief introduction of, of uh, Qatar and the respective speaker bios, please now let me hand over to Ms. Zakra Parves who will take us through Qatar's foreign policy. Thank you, Dr. Shea, for that um, lovely introduction and uh, good morning or good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure being with you today, uh, here today, and I would like to thank the Middle East Institute for inviting me to speak today. I am hoping for this to be more interactive session. I will be talking more about the foreign policy, um, you know, briefly, you know, it needs a big session, but I'm, I've tried to summarize it for you. I'm talking about nationalism in Qatar and the phases that it has gone through, uh, and hoping to hear from all of you towards the end. Um, I will be sharing my presentation with you so you can have the visuals. Please give me a minute. Okay. Right, so, um, sorry, this is not the first slide. Okay, so to begin with, I want to give you a little bit of background of whether it's uh, foreign policy. Um, uh, so, um, as most of you know, Qatar is one of the uh, smaller states in the, in the region. 
um, and but yet it has played a significant role in the uh, in the global and international politics. Um, and part of the reason why it was able to do that was, um, you know, its uh, its importance as one of the uh, uh, um, uh, in energy calculations globally. Uh, you know, Qatar holds the world's third largest natural uh, gas reserves. Um, and so the foreign policy has gone through different transformations. I will be speaking about them more in detail uh, since 1971, after its independence, uh, th though the major underlying principles of the foreign policy have remained uh, quite the same uh, until now. Uh, a primary factor, though, in, in shaping Qatar's foreign policy was the geopolitical location of the peninsula, sharing its border with Saudi Arabia, which is the, the largest country in the region, and also um, previously the hegemon in, in, the, in the region, right? Uh, so in the background of all of these factors, the foreign policy, I would say the major shift um, in Qatar's foreign policy uh, came uh, when Sheikh uh, Hamid bin Khalifa came to office in 1995. Uh, he was the third ruler since Qatar's independence. Um, uh, so it was during, the, so this was a very significant time for Qatar. So, you know, uh, he's now called the father Amir, but um, he laid down uh, a lot of the principles of the uh, of the Qatari foreign policy. It was during his time the permanent constitution was written, the family law was written. It was really the time of nation building, right? And he's also uh, referred to as the, uh, the, um, the person who sole-handedly built the nation. He, of course, before coming to power, he was the, uh, the head of the Supreme Council um, uh, Planning Council, where he was already involved in uh, building infrastructure of the country, etc. Uh, now, uh, during his time, the Qatari foreign policy could be described as the one of pragmatism. Um, in 1990s, when he came to power, he introduced some of the, uh, the fixed principles of Qatar's foreign policy, which included promoting peace uh, and stability, um, uh, encouraging international dispute settlement. He obviously wanted Qatar to have a more prominent role in the uh, globally. Um, and that, I think that was a break from the tradition because previously, and at that time at least, uh, most of the countries in the Gulf went under so the Arabian um, policy outlook, uh, but Sheikh Hamad wanted Qatar to have its own independent policy. During his time, he also focused a lot on the role of international law and the UN. And an example of this is during his time when Qatar had um, uh, had um, uh, land, uh, uh, sorry, uh, territorial dispute uh, with Bahrain over the Hawar Islands, he went to the International Court of Justice rather than going to Saudi Arabia. Do, so during this time, during Sheikh Hamad's time, um, there was two countries that played a major role in shaping Qatar's foreign policy, which was the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. Two major players. Uh, we're just gonna. I'm gonna talk about uh, about this a little bit in the next um, slide. Um, why the U.S.? Uh, because uh, the U.S. during this time, the U.S. built their largest uh, military base. Uh, in Qatar, which is the Al uh, facility, and that kind of gave Qatar very strong footing militarily to go ahead and make take bold, uh, make bold policy, uh, policies uh, in the region. Um, sometimes away from the Saudi uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, policy outlook, uh, and Saudi Arabia was very important as well uh, because not only was it, it's the largest country uh, and and the border a sharing border with Qatar, it also saw Qatar as uh, the, perhaps the only country that was taking on a leadership role um, in the Gulf after Saudi Arabia. Um, so there's two, at that time, the foreign policy uh, was, could be described in, in, in a nutshell and as a, um, to summarize as uh, the policy of political and diplomatic strategy uh, of ambition and influence uh, through two fa major factors. One was the financial tool, so using the sovereign wealth fund to build uh, a Qatar investment authority to build spheres of influence. The second was soft data, and we are going to talk about Jazeera in great detail because it's very important. At that time, during Sheikh Hamad's time, Qatar also, also engaged.
So to our audience, I think we are facing a bit of technical dif difficulties with uh, Zarka's uh, screen and Zoom. So let us try to rectify this and have her back on as soon as possible. In the meantime, uh, just to remind our audience, we'll be taking questions later on. So if you do have some in mind, please feel free to, to put them in our chat box. Uh, and I can then, of course, read it out to our speakers who will then answer the questions from you. So I think we have uh, Zarka back. So we'll just wait for her to come back on in terms of a video and, and, and audio. Yeah, there we have her back. I don't know what happened. And this is the first time this happens. I, I don't know if this is a technical fault or I don't know what happened, but we're back. Okay, so. No worries. Let's please, please, you may continue from where you left off. Just, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Right. Okay, so. We were talking about the foreign policy principles, uh, about the soft power and uh, sorry, Qatar's uh, shuttle diplomacy. Um, so Qatar had uh, successfully uh, um, done mediation between Lebanon, uh, uh, conflict in Lebanon and Saudi, uh, sorry, in Palestine, uh, in Somalia, in Yemen at the time, again, giving it a very prominent role of this peacemaker uh, in the region. Um, uh, so now, uh, coming to the soft power, so um, branding the branding of the state. Now, I want to highlight that every country in the world uh, does some sort of branding, uh, cultural uh, branding, um, to kind of establish themselves distinctively, uh, distinctively in the world. Uh, Qatar had done that uh, uh, through several strategies. We're going to go over some of them very quickly. Um, this branding strategy is what helps uh, Qatar and other countries, indeed, who were doing similar, uh, who were involved in similar nation building processes to uh, kind of give them an, a role of an independent actor uh, um, in, in global politics. Uh, uh, obviously, that this, this branding was very much linked with Qatar's foreign policy, which was the one uh, uh, policy of being a neutral, peace promoting, progressive state. Uh, other efforts through which uh, um, uh, Qatar was involved in, in, in state branding was the use of sports, uh, you know, the 2020 World Cup, the cultural, uh, cultural efforts such as building museums, uh, also uh, the Qatar Foundation. Qatar Foundation, uh, which I'm a graduate of, is also a big kind of factor of uh, the Qatari brand. It is home to some of the uh, world's Ivy League universities. Sarka, I think you're muted again. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't mute myself. I was just muted. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Um, now, one of Qatar's key, uh, I would say, factor in its uh, building its soft power was a Jazeera. Al Jazeera was again built by Sheikh Hamad in 1996, uh, a year after he was in office. Uh, Al Jazeera became a strong diplomacy tool uh, um, in the region. It was a break from the traditional media in the region. It was known for its investigative journalism. Um, it was also uh, came to be known as the voice of the Arab world, showing you the Arab side of the story. Uh, it was very famous for its coverage of Infitada in 2000, uh, Afghanistan war in 2001 and Iraqi invasion in, in 2003. Um, it was kind of 
representative of Qatar's foreign policy outlook in a, in a, in a nutshell. Um, it became the regional hegemon in, uh, um, in, in media. And that's why you saw in 2003, Al Arabiya was launched by, uh, it was a Dubai um, based satellite news broadcaster to kind of counter some of the um, coverage uh, presented by uh, Al Jazeera. Um, so now another, I would say the turning point in Qatar's foreign policy was the Arab Spring. Uh, Arab Spring um, obviously started in uh, 2010, uh, when, you know, when uh, people were on the streets and most of the Arab world um, reclaiming their self-determination, etc. Uh, leading to a series of revolutions. Uh, Qatar obviously was on the side of the people, supporting the people's choice and their right to self-determination, uh, which is against its fixed uh, foreign policy principle. Uh, Qatar obviously, uh, and, uh, and um, one of the biggest ways in which Qatar supported the people, uh, people's choices was to Al Jazeera. You know, there was the revolution that was televised. Uh, a lot of people call it the Twitter revolution, the media revolution. Um, you saw that Jazeera was really on ground, especially in the Egyptian revolution, uh, even in the Bahrain uh, uh, protests, similarly in Libya as well. Uh, Qatar obviously supported the, 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 you know, the democratically elected governments, including the one of Mohamed Morsi. Now, this created a lot of um, tensions between the rest of the Gulf states, uh, they all uh, had a different policy outlook while Qatar was, again, uh, supporting people's choice of people's self-determination based on their um, foreign policy outlook. Uh, the Arab Spring obviously also created a power vacuum in the region, you know, Egypt, which was going through turmoil, Syria was going through turmoil, so there had to be another regional hegemon um, beyond the Gulf on the Middle East level. And that was a vacuum that was to be filled, uh, uh, was being filled by Qatar at that time, but of course leading to a lot of um, tensions between the, the Gulf countries. Um, now I don't have time to go over details. So I'll be happy to take your questions. Um, now, in the midst of the, uh, of, uh, of the, the Arab Spring uh, in 2013, um, there was uh, uh, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad, uh, uh, came to power in a very peaceful way. Uh, you know, um, he, and during his time, the Qatar then again went through another big shift in foreign policy. Um, he obviously inherited a lot of the issues that were going on during, during the Arab Spring or a lot of the tensions between the GCC states. Uh, he initially really focused on um, you know, uh, domestic policies. So focusing on achieving the vision 2030, uh, developing the resources for 2022, uh, focusing on economic stability within the country. Um, but, um, you know, uh, uh, and he also tried to kind of improve the relations with, with the Gulf countries. And that's what you saw during his time, uh, Al Jazeera toned down their, uh, um, uh, toned down their criticism of uh, Sisi's uh, government, the military intervention. Uh, he also invites, uh, you know, you saw Saudi coming to visit Qatar, and there was at that time it seemed like the relationships were were improving um, between the Gulf countries. Um, but behind the scenes, obviously, there was a lot of uh, tensions going on, which is why in 2014, a year after he came to power, you saw the Gulf countries, um, uh, mostly Saudi, UAE, and Bahrain, uh, um, uh, withdrew their ambassadors from Qatar. And that was obviously before the blockade. Uh, during his time, he took a new, new approach to foreign policy, which was called the smart power approach to foreign affairs, which is combining the soft and the hard power while maintaining the constitutional principles. Um, uh, of the of the Qatar's foreign policy, um, so uh, you know while he was working still on improving the relationships with the Gulf countries, uh, it seemed like there was a lot of underlying tensions, uh, especially with Qatar's support of uh, uh, Morsi's regime, which was elected again, and uh, Qatar wanting to improve relationships with Iran and. Um, and this is a vision that wasn't shared with the Gulf. And then, you know, in 2017, a blockade was imposed on Qatar. Uh, again, would be an, another turning point uh, in, in the Qatar foreign policy. Um, this blockade was 
basically uh, imposed uh, on Qatar. It was an illegal blockade, obviously, uh, imposed by UAE, uh, Bahrain, uh, uh, Saudi, and uh, Egypt. Um, and, you know, with a list of um, allegations that Qatar denied, obviously, and it wasn't nothing was proven, but this blockade, and there's a lot that could be said about this blockade, I could actually do another session on it, but I just wanna talk about the foreign policy and the, the nationalism. Uh, this blockade did a lot of things for Qatar, right? It did, it did a lot of things. It changed its policy outlook. It changed uh, um, its economic, social, polit political uh, relations, but it was also, and this is what I'm going to be focusing on, and I think my colleague will talk more, more about the economic aspect. Um, was the the new nationalism that emerged out of the blockade? The blockade showed, you know, that the the, the regional identity, the Khaliji identity, that was previously part of the focus of the Qatari national identity, was now um, uh, is not going to work anymore. You know, uh, uh, there was a, a more of an inward focus focus on more of a localized national identity, uh, national solidarity. You saw hashtags emerge, which uh, were, um, you know. Um, people, and this could be translated as my tribe is Qatar. So, you know, if you know, if uh, you know the uh, national identity in the Gulf, it has several, several layers of identity, including the tribal identity. But given the, the, the blockade, I think people were united just on their national identity, their state identity. Uh, you saw this, uh, the picture that you see in the background is called Tamim and Majd which was the, the it was a it was a painting of the the emir and, and this is all symbols of national identity you know a national hero a national cause national solidarity um conflicts create nations conflicts create nationalism and for qatar this was really i think one of the turning points in history where a localized national identity uh, was emerging um qatar also was becoming more self-sufficient, finding new route, trade routes, new economic uh, relations, new allies. Um, this is, I think, for, for me, for someone who studies nationalism, this was kind of the building blocks of Qatari modern national identity. I'm going to take you to my next slide, which I think is going to be my next, my last slide, yes. Uh, so this is going to be, this is the end of blockade, right? Um, the blockade has just ended uh, uh, a few months ago in 2021. It was um, uh, after three years of, uh, of, uh, of blockade, of trying to negotiate or, you know, different, um, uh, uh, I would say different efforts uh, on part of Qatar uh, and international organizations trying to bring the countries to to negotiate. The blockade ended in a very, I, I would say, for, for for the audience, for the public, it was it was ambiguous. But obviously, there was a lot of talks happening in the background. Um, the 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 blockade ended in a, in a GCC summit in Al Ula in Saudi Arabia. And it was very interesting because GCC had been criticized for being a weak institution that couldn't prevent a conflict within its member states, but it was being used as a platform to announce the end to that very conflict. Uh, what was very interesting about the end of the blockade was that, you know, it showed us that each one of the Gulf countries, including Qatar itself, is going to pursue a different foreign policy. At least that's how I view it. You saw that Saudi was on the front seat. They kind of were the ones, uh, I would say, um, uh, on the forefront of these negotiations, the first ones to also open their borders to Qatar. But then you saw Bahrain and Emirates taking the back seat, uh, you know, um, and the Abu Dhabi's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed didn't issue any official statement. Bahrain obviously didn't open their their um, uh, borders or resumed flights to Qatar until much later. Uh, the blockade uh, had ended also at a very interesting time, which is the time of Biden's uh, administration. And uh, um, also to keep in mind that the blockade started with the Trump's administration's uh, full support to uh, Saudi was a very close ally of Saudi at the time. So the Biden administration coming into office and having a different policy outlook for Qatar and the region, this was a res this was I would say um, uh, reconciliation done out of need necessity. There was obviously not enough time given to people to reconcile after uh, the. Uh, um, 
after the blockade, you know, a lot had been done during, during these three years, people, families have been separated. But during, more importantly, during the blockade, um, each country, or I would say each one of the blockading countries has looked was had uh, uh, I would say created or formed new allies in terms of trade allies in terms of uh, policy outlook we saw uh, UAE normalizing ties with Israel looking for similarly Saudi um, looking to US for uh, um, as an ally Qatar obviously was uh, uh, created new relationships with with Europe also within Asia so it uh, although the block it had ended um, uh, it had shown us that one, and the, the foreign policies uh, are going to be different for each one of the countries. And for Qatar, more specifically, specifically, it showed that it's not going to be compromising on its foreign policy. Uh, the blockade had actually a lot of the allegations of the blockade were attacking Qatar's independent foreign policy. But the fact that it didn't compromise on that shows how important it is in its um, you know, uh, um, it, it's a, how important foreign policy is in its nation building, its international image and its foreign policy principles. I am going to end here. I think it was a very like dense uh, conversation. So we're going to end here and uh, I would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Zaka. I think that was uh a lot packed in about 20 to 25 minutes on Qatar's foreign policy and the shifts and, and how um, the blockades changed uh, the nature of, of Qatar's foreign policy and also about the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council in general, which of course celebrates its 40th year, 40 year anniversary, 40th year anniversary this year. And um, so some of the, the policies that you said Qatar had and you know, recently, you know, there, there was um, also uh, a refuse to compromise on certain aspects of this policy. And so our next speaker, uh, Mr. Omran of Wari, uh, will cover more economic aspects and how uh, specific projects have developed or hastened uh, during the last few years. So over to you, Mr. Kuwari. Thank you very much, Dr. Shai, and thank you for uh... NUS and MEI team for the invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm actually a huge admirer of Singapore. I used to visit a lot uh, back in my uh, previous jobs and I hope to visit as soon as I can. Um, uh, it was a great presentation by uh, my colleague. I will try to complement it, um, providing a high level overview uh, about uh, economic diversification, but it's very hard to talk about the economy without focusing a little bit on the energy sector. And I'll talk about traditional energy sector and then going forward, sustainability and the role of, of Qatar and sustainability. Um, just before I share my slide, just a quick minute about Qatar Foundation. We heard a lot about Qatar Foundation uh, in the introduction by Dr. Shai, but also by from Zarqa. So actually Qatar Foundation is a perfect uh, example uh, of uh, economic diversification. It was established over 25 years ago. It was now 25 year anniversary with this, main objective is to move Qatar from a uh, fossil fuel kind of driven economy to a knowledge-based economy. And, and that was the vision back then. And, and it's actually in, in many measures, it's probably the world's largest um, nonprofit and not just from education, but also we uh, manage the country's uh, and the region's largest uh, research fund. We have several major research institutes and uh, Science Park and so on, National Library, which you mentioned. So uh, we talk about economic diversification, other foundations is a great example. I just had to uh, to highlight that because they pay my bills. So <laughs> let me do this. How's that? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so uh, just to uh, briefly go over the agenda, there'll be three topics. So I'll just cover about liquefied natural gas, LNG. Uh, about the role of LNG in, in, in the economy and its importance. Uh, I think it was covered a little bit by my previous speaker also. And then I'll start talking about sustainability and energy transition. Um, you know, where does LNG fit in that? What does that mean for Qatar? Uh, how is Qatar uh, approaching the energy transition, climate change, and so on? And then uh, touch on, again, um, how has Qatar approached economic diversification? How is that going? And how is their approach different than uh, some of the other uh, countries in the region? So to start off is LNG is interesting because LNG is actually the only uh, currently growing fossil fuel. 
Um, LNG is interesting because it's, it's liquid for natural gas. So it covers, it ticks a lot of boxes for different parts of the world. When you're talking for Asia, for example, it's really about, uh, for China and India, it's about air quality, uh, switching from coal. When you're looking at Europe, it's about import diversity. Uh, when you're talking about um, places like uh, Africa, it's about power demand. So it's it actually, because it is cleaner than coal, because it's more flexible than oil, and because uh, renewables can only develop at a certain speed in some regions, it still has a role to play. And we'll see also, for example, in, during COVID, most of the, uh, besides renewables, all other kind of uh, fossil fuels or, or uh, kind of energy sources took a hit, but gas was the least impacted. And in fact, energy demand here on, uh, now is back to exactly where it was pre-COVID, if not more, actually. Uh, and if you look at um, kind of going forward, it, it is it is looking, it is likely to grow uh, at least for the next 10, 15 years. Uh, because a couple of reasons. One is I mentioned the benefits, but also pipeline building pipelines getting more complex and and sending gas through ships has become cheaper and more effective and, and fle more flexible. So LNG still has uh, a good window um, to play um, in the next 10, 15, 20 years, uh, even conservatively speaking. And the benefit of Qatar having LNG uh, the way it does is that it's, it's the lowest cost and the least carbon intensive LNG in the world. So it can compete anywhere around the world. Um, and also, uh, it's not just the question of selling the LNG. It's also the way the way the structure was set, the way the, the business model was. Uh, and it very much ties into a previous uh, speaker's um, view on geopolitics. So for example, geography, Qatar, uh, is obviously uh, positioned right between Europe and Asia. So it basically, uh, it's, it's customer, it's, it's market is half Asia, half Europe. And it allows uh, the ability to divert or to take advantage of the different markets depending on market conditions. Being right in the middle of the two uh, gives it great flexibility. Whereas, for example, if the, the largest competitor like Australia or some competitors in North Africa, they're limited by scope. And that geography is something that, that has been of, of value. Uh, in terms of business model and partners, also Qatar has taken a very unique approach from the beginning of the of the oil and gas sector, and specifically gas, is to always, uh, initially at least, work with um, international partners. And these are, you know, significant, huge, uh, I mean, at the time, uh, energy companies, um, Total from France, um, Exxon Mobil from the U.S., and then also large Japanese players, Mitsui, Marabini, Shell, ConocoPhillips, and so on. So each of those obviously are not just technical partners, they're also customers, also buyers, they're also partners. So they have invested interest to make sure that these operations flow and that the, the everything is, is, is you know, um, uh, goes as planned because they have a significant uh, impact on, on the economies of where these countries deliver gas. Uh, and interestingly also, we mentioned, the uh, previous speaker mentioned the, the role of the U.S. And this very much um, ties into to this because uh, in the early, in the mid 90s, when Qatar was developing its LNG um, program, uh, the initial partner was BP from the UK, but they pulled out. And when they pulled out, Mobile at the time came in and right before the Exxon Mobile merger. And that was really when US investment uh, came into the country and, and US quickly became the largest trading partner after that. So that the LNG is clearly connected to the uh, kind of the historical um, kind of relationship with with the U.S. and and, uh, and also uh, in a way with the U.K. Uh, as a consequence of that. Having said that, uh, uh, there's also uh, the regional aspect. So gas is is growing not just globally but especially in the region. Uh, and um, Qatar having a huge reserves and ability to export gas uh, plays an important part uh, regionally. Also, Qatar exports LNG to uh, Kuwait, to the UAE, uh, but also pipeline gas to the UAE. Um, and, uh, you know, there's always been efforts or discussions around working with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is obviously oil rich and going to be renewables rich, but uh, not necessarily gas rich. And gas is, is really the, the cheapest, cleanest, fastest way to produce large amounts of power still. And, uh, and this is where it also gives, gives Qatar geopolitical importance. And customers, I mentioned partners, but also customers. So, for example, um, I say here in the UK, 15% uh, of all UK gas comes from Qatar, uh, which is a huge amount, as you can imagine. So imagine heating 
in the winter, there's your geopolitical importance there. In Japan, around 10% of Japanese uh, LNG gas comes from Qatar. India, uh, it can go up to 5, 10%. So uh, these are significant economies and who have a huge dependence on, on Qatar. And Qatar has a huge kind of uh, responsibility. And there has not been uh, any disruptions, any kind of delays or anything in the last uh, 20 plus years, uh, which, which is actually very interesting in the context of the blockade also. Because despite the blockade, despite um, air and, and uh, channel, air and sea channels and borders uh, being closed and tightened, there, there was not one misshipment. Uh, even actually the gas pipeline to UAE continued as as planned. So I think it's also part of Qatar's um, really keen to show that when you you know when you enter into a, a, an agreement and um, they honor it from a partner perspective, also from a, a supplier perspective. And it just, it just, you see that being reinforced with the uh, kind of the ratings for A rating agencies. Um, when they go out for lenders, uh, project financing, Qatar is always well positioned because of its reputation, which also was tested uh, during the blockade. So that's kind of um, the, the role of energy, the importance of it in the short term, and, and how it ties into geopolitics. Uh, however, uh, as we've all seen around the world, net zero is, is, is actually now uh, not just the concept. In terms of uh, large economies taking in 2015 at zero 2060 in china which will mean eventually natural gas will will take a hit and what i've done here is i've plotted the most aggressive kind of um scenarios towards net zero i mean at zero is arguable obviously if it will happen uh this is in line with paris agreement and so on but let's assume it does you still see natural gas will will drop but what the, actually the the starting startling image here is that it doesn't drop that much compared to oil or coal for example uh, but it does drop eventually. Uh, I did mention earlier that Qatar's LNG is, is, is the most economic and cleanest, so it should be relatively well positioned. But you know, the, the energy markets move fast, uh, and things can change fast based on behavior, based on uh, the whole uh, climate change movement, uh, which is now no longer uh, disputable in terms of uh, impact. So the the point here is that yes, it'll drop, not drop as fast, but it will drop, and eventually, uh, Qatar, um, you know, leadership. Uh, we'll have to kind of uh, understand that and deal with that. Whether it's 10, 20, 30, or 40 years, it will happen. Um, it's just a question of, of scale. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, Qatar is, is positioning itself as a leader of sustainability and has positioned itself. Actually, it's always been part of the agenda, uh, interestingly. Um, we'll talk about National Vision 2030, but one of the four pillars that, that's been around for over 15, 20 years has been sustainability. And sustainability is not just from an environmental perspective also economic perspective but in, in, the, in this case i was talking about the environment but sustainability has always been a key focus in, in, in running thread and running thread and all the key initiatives all the key projects and so on so um it has for example qatar uh hosted uh, the the cop 18 the climate conference um was the first one to be hosted in the gulf it was a very uh, important one uh, qatar took leadership position in that um, and they used the opportunity to showcase and to show it, it's the, the importance of what they're trying to do in this area. Uh, and also, uh, it was it was not a, a easy time. I mean, now it seems obvious climate change and so on. But you know, going back to five, six, seven years ago, uh, for a Gulf country that's 90, 80, 90 percent dependent on fossil fuels to to host a climate conference, uh, it was not easy. It probably uh, added some of the uh, kind of kind of tension you can say, but. It did show that Qatar is willing to be part of the conversation. It wants to be part of the conversation and also wants to kind of be part of this north south uh, developing uh, developed world conversation around the carbon emissions, historic carbon emissions and so on. So it was a very uh, important symbolic move uh, to host that conference. And then also after that, and even before that, some of these actually materialized to actually huge projects. So I will not list all the statistics and all the major projects and so on. But I think these are four important ones. So the World Cup, as, as you probably know, is happening next year. And it was the first carbon neutral World Cup to be ever launched. And that was, again, remember, this was this bid was done over 10 years ago. So this was announced 2011. 2000, 2011 was the strategy to be a carbon neutral uh, World Cup. And that was really visionary at the time. It was seen as, you know, pretty radical. But that's the reality. And uh, very interesting approaches to kind of, uh, you know, white elephant stadiums where Qatar is building these stadiums that can actually be, then be 
reduced and rebuilt uh, in other parts of the world so that you don't have this additional infrastructure. They're using reusing material with local material. Uh, everything about the whole World Cup is about um, reducing emissions. It's all in one compact city as opposed to a huge country, so you don't need to travel around. So it was all based around uh, reducing carbon, carbon neutrality, well, well be, uh, before this was kind of, uh, I would say, uh, trendy, at least for the region. Uh, Qatar Petroleum uh, has a climate change strategy, which you would say is normal for energy company, but actually it's for a national oil company to be so so kind of uh, progressive is interesting They, they and, and definitely noteworthy. Uh, Qatar launched the climate change strategy last this year, and even before that, they were always um, uh, head of the pack in terms of reducing uh, decarbonization, the value chain, reducing their methane emissions, using uh, as much uh, technology to reduce flaring and so on. Um, you know, the previous narrative that LNG is good because it, it, it basically moves away people coal to LNG is obviously true, but uh, the Qatar Petroleum did not just depend on that. They wanted to go further and, and that has, um, you know, definitely differentiated them from other national oil companies. And, and they see themselves as an international oil company in terms of performance and standards. So that's something that's noteworthy. Uh, Qatar is also uh, launching four gigawatts of solar energy is in construction now. And they have a huge kind of electrification campaign on buses and, and vehicles uh, that's under ongoing. And here we have a picture of Mesheda, which is the first uh, sustainable downtown regen regeneration project. So this is interesting. Uh, so should say first, not this. Um, it's interesting because it's not a kind of a new city where other other kind of approaches have been taken around the world. It's actually a city that's part of the city that's been there for a long time and is just kind of regenerated and re rebuilt with its old principles, uh, but with new technology using old kind of uh, agricultural Islamic agriculture it fits with our culture, but using technology, smart technology and so on. And it's actually up and up and running now. And it's been uh, uh, really um, a good example of, of how you can do this without having to kind of uh, rebuild things uh, in a way that uh, may not be as sustainable as it, as it may seem. And, and, uh, and, you know, I think this, like I mentioned, this is a part of the DNA of, of Qatar in terms of, of how they see um, development in terms of sustainability, but also uh, because of its role in energy, which is, you know, Qatar and Australia always compete as who's the largest uh, kind of producer, but um, in many ways it's a it's leader in energy. I, I think taking advantage of, of that ecosystem of having all these energy companies and the research that's now based there with this vision of, of wanting to to kind of uh, be part of, the, of, of, of on the table and sustainability and taking leadership position, I think Qatar is very well positioned to to kind of uh, to be active in that, and that not just what comes things I mentioned here, but also in terms of international investments, in terms of uh, policies they can take, in terms of help integrating with their uh, development strategy or aid strategy around the world. Um, you you can see um, more and more trend of integrating sustainability and climate change into into that thinking. In terms of economic diversification. Uh, uh, as you may have probably heard from others, other lectures from other GCC countries, diversification is always uh, a main thing. You know, uh, parts ever since uh, you know oil and gas being produced, how do you diversify away from oil and gas? And it's always been a challenge uh, for these countries. Uh, not it's, it's the same for Qatar, obviously. Qatar, though, is starting from a probably better position in terms of, of having uh, accumulated wealth and also um, having a smaller population. And being dependent on gas as opposed to oil gives us a bit more time, you can say. Uh, but having said all that, Qatar is also taking some kind of unique different approaches uh, as opposed to what you see um, in some other countries. Uh, again, diversification has been a theme that's run across the national, QNV's national vision. Uh, and it's not just economic development, it's diversification also. Uh, and you can see that that some of this um, efforts is, work, is paying back. I mean, Qatar's GDP, dropped like everybody's in 2020 but dropped the least of any other gc country and, and it's actually forecasted to bounce back faster than other countries um and uh, an indication of that is already uh, a few months ago qatar announced a 10 billion dollar bond uh to, for to, to fund this energy expansion and it's been getting a, a great feedback despite a relatively a modest oil environment and COVID still still kind of uh, obviously not not uh, hasn't gone anywhere in many parts of the world but that shows confidence in, in itself, but also in the international markets. 
and huge, huge infrastructure spending uh, before the World Cup and after, actually. I mean, I mean, uh, since 2003, I mean, actually, I don't remember. I think I, I since 1999, since I graduated university, I, I don't remember walk, driving around Qatar and not seeing construction, literally. And it's not just stadiums are the easy part. It's It was uh, before that we had we hosted the Asian Games 2006 and now the World Cup. But besides those two sporting events, there's been huge investments in highways. Uh, the port has been rebuilt. The airport has been rebuilt. Uh, there's a, um, a very advanced uh, rail system, um, and so on and on and on. And, on. and I think it, it was it was always seen as an investment. Um, and and even post World Cup, there were still significant projects happening. So, so this is uh, I think, and it was always from the lens of we build this infrastructure, uh, it will help enable kind of future uh, businesses, future clusters that we're developing, um, and that that's the idea, and, and that's what has been happening. And of course, sovereign wealth, wealth fund QIA is very well managed, very strong, very well diversified from the beginning, uh, as as nature of sovereign wealth funds. Uh, and these kind of like just these that kind of just uh, examples of, of diversification uh, that it's working, uh, that it's 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 kind of um, uh, embedded in the way we, we approach things. But uh, to go a bit, a bit more specific in examples, um, you know, how do we how are we approaching diversification? And how are we also looking in a what I call net zero world in a world that's post fossil fuels? Uh, so those two things are different, but they're slowly kind of interacting with each other more and more. Uh, and here you see the National Vision 2030. So keep in mind this National Vision 2030, which came out uh, more than 10 years ago, I think 2011. So uh, you know we've heard of other national visions recently, but this has been around almost 20 years. And just so you know, this, this vision is actually a project plan which is going down to ministries and private company private sector and, and kpis and constantly monitored uh, so these four pillars are actually then um, expanded to different areas and obviously they interact so we talk about diversification it's not just about economic development it's about environmental development social human all those things and and this has been like i said a, a very important thread of, of the previous maybe i don't know uh, 20 years uh uh, government strategy and budgets. So uh, how has that translated though uh, on the ground? So uh, this is something that you see in other 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 parts of the region, uh, private sector support, obviously, but there's been a huge improvement in ease to do business. There's been huge investment in small and medium enterprise development and a push towards entrepreneurship. Uh, as some countries, other countries in the region also experience, there's a need or understanding that it, there needs to be a move away from uh, heavy public sector kind of employment moving towards private sector and the government has identified where those obstacles are and how you can encourage them and, and we started to see a lot of a booming kind of thriving entrepreneurship kind of even um, venture capital for example all those kind of um, enablers are starting to, to, to kind of uh, blossom slowly in the country. Uh, we also see free zones. Uh, we have the free zone authority of science, uh, science technology park. We have a lot of all those providing huge amounts of benefits for countries, uh, companies coming to set up uh, with, uh, for example, we have Google Cloud now that just announced, uh, I believe, uh, and we have um, Microsoft, uh, uh, GE, all those companies have been around for quite a while in Qatar, uh, and they all have uh, incentives to come bring their, bring their IP, bring their people. Uh, and, and base, base their operations out of there. And RDI, research development and, and innovation, has been a big part of Qatar Foundation has been doing, but also not the country. It's, it's the largest R&D fund in the region and the most established, uh, very, very uh, effective. Um, it's globally competitive. It's one of the, we partner with people all over the world. Uh, three research institutes, globally recognized, and now with National Council for Research, which is a, a lot of it was inspired by actually Singapore's uh, efforts and 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 kind of story how they got to where they are. So um, you know this is a kind of like the the some of the enabling support areas, but also uh, leadership position in, in these other clusters. So we did hear a lot about soft power, but uh, I can tell you from someone who's worked in a lot of these organizations from the inside, uh, I think my personal opinion is that soft power was a, a lot of times a consequence, but not the objective. So. When Qatar Foundation was set up 25 years ago, when uh, Jazeera was was built 20 25 years ago, also and so on, 
it was really a, around a business case or a need or a desire to provide quality education for the region or to be a voice for the Arab street or to be kind of, uh, you know, so I think, uh, and, and that's why I think a lot of these are successful and have been around for a long time is that they, they were built for the right reasons and built, took time to be built. And then I think, I think obviously, uh, as any government will do, will try to, uh, you know, market, market themselves. But, uh, and of course there are some of those projects like everywhere else in the world, but I can tell you that a lot of these, um, the, the the founders behind them, the leadership, it was actually from a place of wanting to be involved and to do the right to do to do the right thing and many times and also see an opportunity, see a gap. Qatar Airways is one of that, is to be not just an airline for Qatar, but to be a global airline, to connect Asia with Europe and South America, for example. And it's become a huge uh, made Doha a huge hub which led to tourism. Uh, and so on and so on. So you see these examples. You were talked about the foundation already. Qatar Foundation was the idea behind it initially was we want our people, our meaning the region's people, to get the same education as anywhere else in the world, but in, in our local context. So how do we do that? And then they, they created this business model of education city. So you have 40% or so of the students are Qatari, 60% from all over the world. We have students from, I think, six, 65 or 70 countries. Um, and you could take, you know, your student in, in Georgetown, like I think Zarqa was, you could take a year in, in Washington, you can come and do a year in Doha, you could take courses in Northwestern while you're in Georgia. So very innovative model. Um, and the idea was really was for the region. So, but also the benefit of all these things is that they create clusters. So when you have 10,000 people in Education City, uh, a good percentage of them are professors and researchers, they bring their families. Same thing with the world, with the, all these infrastructure building for sports. You have these sports events, you, you have these athletes and you have the training grounds there and you have a, a sports hospital, which is one of the top in the world and so on and so on. These create these clusters that bring people and bring, uh, you know, um, real uh, real weight behind them, uh, which I really believe uh, is, is one of the main reasons for diversification. So now when we're going to this next stage of diversification and expansion is how do we use these clusters? Uh, how do we leverage them? Uh, and grow them more to to kind of uh, benefit and and I think that that has been quite successful uh, in terms of resilience also we touched on that previously so and this was really a stress test you can say so definitely the blockade was a stress test but also was an opportunity to to fast track certain things so uh, I mentioned QIA before so foreign investments played a big role uh, not just in terms of influence but also the returns allows us to diversify but also uh, when we saw our, our uh, air air and sea channels all blocked we had to figure out new logistics new kind of corridors turkey india iran all of those are getting attention but also it's much more expanded it's east africa and so all those things were happening and um, but when you have 80 or 90 percent of your food going through a saudi border and all of a sudden you don't have that you have to start rethinking how you're going to do that and, and that's happened so logistics, but also start looking at fast tracking uh, local manufacturing, local uh, agriculture where it makes sense. And there's been a huge swing in terms of what is imported versus what's uh, produced locally. And also that ties into entrepreneurship because when the government saw this is a, is a need, they then channeled those funds and those programs to entrepreneurs. So you have a huge amount of, you have a huge culture now of local markets and and you know um, uh, seasonal foods and supermarkets of Qatari made stuff, which was never really part of it. Was very niche before, but now it's become like super trendy and uh, and successful and useful for the country. So it, it it took it took the blockade. It created, but also now become in the source for economic diversification and decarbonization. So I mentioned before, QP is not just you know we're selling gas and oil and we'll see what happens. No, they're actually looking at how do we make it cleaner. How do we Work with our customers to make sure that they're, they're, the 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 chain is as efficient as possible. What other technologies can we start looking at to support what we're doing? So it's it, that's and I I I I consider that resilience extending the impact of 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 what you're doing in energy, but also being open to new things like renewables. Uh, so this is the last slide. And I thought it's important to think about Qatar and Singapore because I I think a lot of other countries in the region probably look at Singapore as a country who's hugely successful and was able to build a you know a international uh, international recognized kind of powerhouse in its own way 
But I think Qatar specifically looks at Singapore in a different way because just uh, more similarities. And I try to look at it not from political, but from sustainable sustainability, economic diversification. You know, I think we Qatar looks at leveraging its resources and its geography. So we talked about that before. Uh, looking at and, and these are natural resources, but now it's also people resources. I think uh, you know the investment in Qatar Foundation, 25 years, um, really in top-notch education. I think you know the the the, the continued uh, consistent investment into human capital is really starting to uh, pay off, and uh, and that's never been wavered. And geography is another thing. Also, it, it could be in some cases uh, uh, something that. Uh, you know, limits your options or something you think, but in a way also gives you uh, a global view and uh, forces you to think outside the box in terms of part, you know, energy partners and investments, so on. So that that's something that I think worth mentioning. Nimble decision making, Qatar, you know, quickly able to to create new logistic routes, quickly able to announce new projects and implement them uh, based on uh, you know whatever the need is. Uh, focus on good governance. You know, Qatar. I think we, I mentioned Qatar Petroleum's kind of record on the, on and its partnerships and so on. I think that's something that um, Qatar government is very kind of focused on. I mean, you I don't, you may or may not notice this is probably uh, something to note. The Minister of Finances actually has been, uh, I think, uh, well, has been replaced, but also under investigation um, last month for for. Uh, Misuse of funds, and you know, obviously, who, who knows what what the investigation will come up. But what, what the message shows is that in Qatar is that there's no to zero tolerance for any corruption. But not only that, is is it's the real focus on good governance, uh, and to make sure that when we build something, we build it properly, uh, whether it's a company or a government organization, and then understanding global trends. So Qatar, you know, obviously, I mentioned these these examples, but also looking forward, where can where can we play a role? Where should we play a role? Uh, you know what's 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 our um, kind of advantages? What's our uh, uh, what can we use for our advantage uh, and play a global role? It's always about global Qatar. It's never uh, about just playing a regional role or a small role. But it's not about uh, soft power or anything. It's about really um, uh, wanting a seat at the table and and having a belief that we can, especially in areas that I mentioned, uh, and a track record now. So there's confidence behind that. And finally, I think investment in education, I think I mentioned that many times, but it's really a huge part. And now I would say investment in education, in education and and also research and development. I think those two points, uh, understanding that the, the impact will be long term and uh, you may not see it uh, for a long, until a while. But when it does come, it creates a, a different kind of um, um multiplier that, that you cannot uh, have in any other industry. And I think that differentiates Qatar a little bit uh, from the region and it ties in directly to diversification. So that's really uh, my slides. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm on schedule or not, but I think I'll end sharing here and of course, happy to take any questions. Thanks Omran. And also thanks Zakra from, from the previous presentation. Now we shall enter the Q and A segment. And of course, we will definitely leave some time for questions, about 15 minutes. So I will um, group the questions from the floor and so that we can, we can speed things up and address as many questions as possible from the floor. So um, we've already got a number of questions and I, I wouldn't like to tell my audience to keep their brain juices churning, but we have a list. Uh, starting with um, the first one from Nadia Farhana. The question is, there are international calls for concern about human rights linked to projects related to the World Cup 2022. What has Qatar done to debunk this and guarantee the rights of foreign workers? So who would like to take this uh, question? Go ahead, Zaka. Yeah, I can go ahead. I want to yeah. thank you, Aran, for the very interesting presentation. Um, 
I think there's a lot has already been happening. There's a lot of conversations. I was also involved in a lot of these conversations. You know, the ILO has its office in Qatar. We have uh, independent, um, uh, uh, there are independent institutions working on these concerns. I know the, um, the road to 2020, which uh, 2022 itself is very much invested into the welfare of the workers and kind of dealing with any issues and concerns that come up. So I would say I'm very positive um, that these issues are being dealt with. Uh, we just had a conversation, I think, a few months ago on International Women's Day, also bringing gender into the conversation. We we're talking about the, the you know, um, migrant workers. We also want to talk about the gender aspect of it. So I think there is a, there is a lot that's been happening behind the scenes. A lot of new policies are being created to make sure that um, their welfare is protected, their voice is heard, and action is being taken, whether it's in terms of uh, working hours, whether in terms of uh, their um, you know, sponsorship rights, etc. So, in a nutshell, that's my answer to you. I think it's all. It's this is being taken very seriously, and uh, a lot of conversations and action, more importantly, is happening. Yeah. Thank you, Zakar. Um, we've got another set of questions, and I think this one will be appropriate for Umran to answer this, and it's about um, Qatarization. So it's how is Qatar, this is from Paul Freeland and his, his question is how is Qatar balancing the pursuit of Qatarization and providing good jobs for citizens and also retaining international outlook, bringing in much needed foreign talent and businesses? How does the small number of Qatari citizens within the national population help or hurt those efforts? And these, there's also a similar question from Nadia on this, so I'll let uh, Umran take this. Yeah, I mean, this is a very good question, a very important point. I think, uh, I think uh, a phrase that I've seen uh, within kind of circles, government circles in the past like 15, 20 years kind of working on these issues is quality Qatarization. Because I think the, the focus is not just to Qatarize, but also to Qatarize and make sure that when we do Qatarize, uh, the Qataris are ready to take the positions. So uh, at the same time, there's a huge recognition of the value that the expat community has been giving uh, and, and is giving the country. So there's always a balance, right? You don't want to um, move too fast and then lose some of those people who helped you help build your country and help run things. And also, uh, but at the same time, you also want to give opportunities. So I think uh, it's, it's it's a broad question. So it depends, private sector depends and government, government is putting targets, but they're kind of, I would say, uh, not as uh, aggressive as, for example, you've seen in Saudi Arabia or Kuwait, partly because we have, I guess, a different uh, population pool, different uh, economic situation. But there, there is definitely encouragement from the government to start to really, I mean, every every comp every major company, every major semi-government so has to have a Qatarization plan. They have to have relative targets. But also there's an understanding that this has to be done uh, while maintaining quality, and that, that is done differently depending on the organizations. Um, I think also um, there's a lot of, of, uh, of research being done on what has worked in other countries, uh, other regions besides the Gulf, like for example, Norway, um, you know, especially fossil fuel countries um, who have transitioned a little bit um, towards uh, providing more opportunities for local population. So I think there's a lot of work around that, trying to bring in best practice. Uh, and, and but I would say that in some of the key sectors like uh, oil and gas and, and banking, uh, there is a very successful characterization um, efforts. And I think now the government realizing that instead of focusing characterization, it's let's let's in, let's foster a private sector, let's develop entrepreneurship, and let that be uh, where a lot of really you know ambitious smart Qatar young Qataris that want to. Uh, develop go into as opposed to just going to only government. Obviously, you want excellent people in government, but you also want more and more of those people to be in the private sector. And I think that's where I think um, Qatar may have a chance to do things a little bit differently. Thanks, Omar. Um, another group of questions, and I'm grouping them together from Yu Chenzi and Ong Pao Shen, is about the blockade. And um, so the first question, well, related questions, I'm going to group them together. Can you elaborate on how the blockade changed the media landscape? Did it lead to restructuring of uh, finance to the, to the to media? And also among the 13 demands that were uh, organized, that were put forward by the blockading quartet, were these met? So I maybe Zakra would like to, to take this, uh, this set of questions. Um, so 
in terms of restructuring of media, I, I, I want to first highlight that, that the blockade uh, attacked very particularly, one of the demands was to shut down Al Jazeera. And an attack on, on Al Jazeera was an attack on uh, journalism, uh, uh, freedom of journalism all around the world. You know, and I've said that that is elsewhere. I've said this in my articles, um, and I think and so Al Jazeera was not shut down, um, and uh, so it continued. Really, it did it kept doing what it was doing. Um, I don't think there was a restructuring of, of of media, but then I think there was Al Jazeera saw it as a responsibility now to continue that investigative journalism even even more you know and the role that they had played in kind of um re to, to, to representing people's voices and i think what was happening during that time it was really kind of like you know it was a media war the the, the cold uh, sorry the block i keep calling it the cold war but it was the modern day, it was the present day cold war uh, or the media war at arabia or other news outlets were kind of um creating their own uh, uh, kind of narratives uh, against Qatar. So um, I think that, no, I think Jazeera, because you're talking about the block in particular, so the attack very particularly was on a Jazeera. Um, I, I, um, they kept going. I think they kept doing what they were doing. Um, in terms of the 13 demands, um, no, actually, none of that. I think there was a lot of negotiations that happened behind the scenes, like I said. I think a lot of people saw this as something uh, abrupt and people weren't expecting, but I think as a, as a, as a political analyst and as a political science student, I, I don't think it was abrupt. I, there was very different moments where I thought this was about to happen. Uh, I think this was a very well thought out and negotiated uh, reconciliation. Uh, the demands, I don't think they were fully met because a lot of them were, to begin with, not um, and not uh, had no grounding, were, you know, just false allegations. So I don't think they were all met, I, but I don't think there was a middle ground that was met um, between the Gulf countries. But certainly, I just, you um, because you know you, you asked a particular person about media i don't think jazeera has changed its ways but i do think that when the re reconciliation happened you do did you see you saw a jazeera showing us uh, a saudi tourism spot so i think they kind of went ahead with the with the state vision towards reconciliation thank you zakra and i hope we answered su huang Yi's question as well on, on foreign policy because these three are quite related. Um, let's move on to another set of questions on education. I think we've got one uh, question from the floor asking whether the move towards English as a medium of instruction uh, has has done well, has bode well for for Qatar, and, and, and that is in mind. That is in mind of the uh, education city. So I'll, I'll save that for for Umran. And the other set of question on domestic politics. Number one, we have one question from Saud Al Ishaq. Uh, to what extent do you think that this new national identity will circumscribe tribal identity in the upcoming Shura Council elections? And also another question from Nitin uh, on the peaceful transfer of power from Amir Hamad to Amir Tamim. Is this a new normal or are there worries of such transfer in future from Nitin? So um, I'll leave uh, Zaka to take the, the questions on domestic politics and and. Omran, you may start off with the question on education, please. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Uh, that Darka takes those questions. <laughs> yeah, I think in terms of education, uh, actually, it's it's not quite uh, exactly the case. I mean, the, the universities are in English, obviously, because they're American or British or they're in university, but uh, K-12, which is the, the schools are bilingual. And uh, the idea was that they're international baccalaureate type uh, schools. Uh, but there's a very strong focus on Arabic. So the idea is uh, that students graduate or that the Arab students graduate dual-lingual. So I wouldn't say that it's... Um, and, and actually, the official language of Qatar Foundation is actually still Arabic. So it, it's... It, and one of the four pillars, one of the four kind of... Uh, five, sorry, themes of Qatar Foundation's uh, strategy is to preserve uh, Arab culture. So it's always a balance, obviously. Uh, you know, we... Um, but we haven't actually gone to the extreme uh, where in you, English is the main language or anything like that. But I think it was recognition that it has to be, the standard of English has to be global. So there's always a, a focus on making it dual. Um, and I think 
um, this dual baccalaureate type approach is, is, is hopefully going to be uh, a new standard for the region. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really about being dual and it's, in a lot of cases trilingual also. Um, so no, yeah, so that's how we balance it. The universities, of course, um, are in English, but Georgetown, for example, has a very strong Arabic language program. Uh, Habib Khalifa University is one of the leaders in translation in the world, Arabic to other languages. Uh, we have uh, in Qatar Computing Institute, also the leading program in the world in Arabic uh, translation software, artificial intelligence in Arabic, because it's a big gap. You know, the Arab world is, 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 is um, you know, three, four hundred million people, whatever it is. And, and there hasn't been enough uh, focus on it in terms of content uh, and in terms of uh, technology. Um, and I think Qatar Foundation sees itself as playing a big role in that. Thanks, Omran. Moving on to Zakra, who will answer the question of domestic politics. Two questions, really. Yeah, so the first question is about national identity and tribal identity in Shura Council. This is by Sir. Yes, that's right. Uh, what's the, sorry, what's the second question? So do you think, to what extent do you think the national identity will circumscribe tribal identity in the upcoming elections? Yeah, and then the second question? The second question is about the transfer of power from Sheikh Hamad to Sheikh Hamim, is this a new normal in terms of the nature of, of transition, power transition? Okay, I'll start with the national identity question. Um, thank you, Saud, for your question. Um, so, so tribal identity is tribal politics. You've asked a very important question, but that also a question that probably cannot be answered uh, in this short period of time. Um, I think tribal politics or tribalism has been kind of an innate part of Gulf politics. Um, has been innate part of national identity. Um, for me, I think there is an inherent tension that exists between in, in, the, in, the, in the national identity model in the Gulf countries, purely because national identity as a concept is a very European concept, right? In terms of intellectual concept, it's a very European concept. It has been taken um, and tried to adapt it to their realities in the region. That was uh, many other things amongst which a tribal setting, right? Uh, so there has been, I think all, of, not just Qatar, I think all of the Gulf countries are trying to find this, this, this the place of the tribe in, 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 the, in the national politics or in the national identity. Uh, because previously the tribe was uh, um, a source of identity itself. A tribe was a nation in itself, right? So I think there's this, there is, there are, uh, so there's inherent, I think, there are inherent, um, I would say challenges or inherent, uh, I would say, paradox that exists within the national identity uh, as intellectual project versus the realities on the ground. I don't see that. I don't think that both are are incompatible, obviously. But I think there has to be a new model. So I, I think the the blockade provided Qatar uh, a, a new model for national solidarity, one that uh, that provides that looks at the at the civil identity or the national. Uh, state identity as as a focus of of new identity, but I do think this idea of tribal identity is going to, I would say, fade away. I don't know if it should fade away, uh, or I don't think it's going to completely disappear. What role it will play in Shura Council? Um, I think it's very much uh, present, like I said, because it's not it's not a thing that would change overnight. I, I think it might have uh, strategies might have shifted, um, but I think. Uh, at least for now, the the, uh, the idea of tribal uh, tribalism or tribal politics very much exists in the Gulf and needs more time for it to evolve. You know, uh, in terms of the transfer of power, um, when it comes to the transfer of power in the Gulf, there is no norm. <laughs> there is norms always being created. I think the Sheikh Tamim model was very. It was, it was a great model. It was very peaceful. It was very um, you know, uh, something that was done out of need, um, a, a very political uh, uh, move. But um, I think it should be, I think it should be uh, possibly the new model, but I don't know if it will be, you know. The if transfer of power is always something that's sometimes unpredictable, sometimes takes you by surprise. So I think it should be, I don't know if it will be. Thank you, Zaka. So, because you have been such an engaging audience, we'll go for one last round of questions to our both to our two speakers. Uh, the first one, the first set, I guess, is for uh, Mr. Omran here, which is on which is from Yo Chen Zi. Uh, 
Ms. Omran, your research interest lies in hydrogen as a form of energy. What is Qatar's vision of developing a hydrogen economy for the future? And that's for you, uh, Omran. And we have for Zarka um, a couple of questions really, but we'll just, we just select two from here. Um, what is Qatar's position on Iran after the presidential elections from Enoch? And another question from my colleague, Asif Shruja is, uh, could you please elaborate if there's a theoretical model for the fact that you said conflicts create a nation and nationalism? So we'll start with Omran on hydrogen first. Yep, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I think without getting into two technicals, um, I mean, hydrogen is, is, uh, is, is something that's been, uh, I would say kind of really all over the news in the past six months or so on. And I think it's because it's it, obviously it's very flexible and you can produce hydrogen from a lot of different ways, um, from fossil fuels, but also from uh, electric electricity and renewable energy. And it, it technically can resolve a lot of problems from a climate perspective. And and especially for countries that, that uh, are importers or have ability to produce a lot of renewable energy locally. Um, so, so depending on where you are, uh, I guess on the energy uh, uh, landscape, hydrogen means different things for you. I think for a country like Qatar, hydrogen uh, it, it it will will it will play a role in the sense that it will be a new product in the world that the, the world will will want will need. So Qatar will try to see, uh, will try to figure out ways where it can participate. Um, but to move to a hydrogen economy. Uh, is not necessarily something that that Qatar uh, will or should do, because they still have a huge amount of renewables, have a huge amount of, of gas that they can, uh, uh, you know, produce locally and electrify using that to electrify. So I think countries that have have announced hydrogen economies are countries like Japan uh, or you know other other countries that have you know parts of their industry will be hydrogen based, and that's for other reasons. Um, so I think you know Qatar will. I don't know what their hydrogen economy um, uh, strategy will be, but I do know that there are research efforts. There's understanding that LNG can provide the the, the feedstock for hydrogen uh, in many parts of the world, um, and and Qatar is, is well positioned if it wants to to play a role there. I think our other neighbors, uh, like Saudi Arabia, for example, and UAE, are, are really going deep into hydrogen. Mainly because they they see it as an opportunity to to uh, to start a new industry to ex ex export um, using their 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 local uh, huge uh, domestic kind of renewable reserves, uh, and they also see it as a way for them to diversify uh, their industry. But you know the plans announced and uh, the technology still has a long way to go to reach a huge scale. So it remains to be seen as to how much of those projects actually materialize around the world. And and I think Qatar. Uh, has been very good in monitoring, and then when they feel the opportunity is right, they jump in in the right right place. But they're not in the position where they uh, necessarily should uh, move towards hydrogen economy. Thank you, Omran. Zakra, your your turn. Yes. Yeah, so the first question was about Qatar's position on the Iranian I Iran, Iran, and the yeah. second about conflicts create nationalism right um the about the question about the iranian elections uh, to be very honest with you i'm not really sure on what the qatar's position on these specific elections is but the overall position is like i said earlier in my presentation that qatar does uh, see the importance of having negotiations with iran uh, you know uh, which some uh, other countries were um against seemingly uh, though they were having a lot of conversations behind the scenes though they were still conducting business with them now Saudi is also um has been seen and you know keen to have a conversation with iran i think it's important um uh, for the region at least for the regional peace so i think uh, you know I don't have any specific comments on the election, but I think whatever the, the results of the election are, I think Qatar seems to be keen to be working with Iran, um, you know, uh, um, for the future of the, of the region, uh, um, or as an impa important factor in the, uh, in the future of the region. Uh, in terms of conflicts create nationalism, this is uh, something very well known in the theory of nationalism, you know, uh, nationalism as an as a intellectual project of 19th century builds on this idea of us versus them, 
right? So uh, in order for you to be define yourself as a political limited entity with its own, uh, you know, your own land, your own army, your own flag, uh, symbols of your, your nation, you have to define yourself against the other. You have to create some sort of solidarity. And that solidarity only happens, you know, why would you go and fight for your fellow citizens, which you maybe never met most of them, we never really meet them. Why would you go and kill or die for these citizens? This kind of solidarity, this kind of patriotism has to be created against an external threat. So if you look at models of earlier models of nationalism, uh, you know, in the modern state, such as the French Revolution, you know, the French state was created eventually out of a series of revolutions that happened in France. So uh, certainly, again, with the British example, and there are so many other examples. Um, where conflicts kind of give you this cause to come together, this, this feeling of solidarity, the need to protect, protect your homeland. Um, that's how conflicts create nationalism. In the Gulf countries, um, there weren't these kind of conflicts that happened, uh, you know, these kind of armed conflicts, although there were other conflicts that took place, but not, in, not like an independence struggle. For example, Egypt went through a huge struggle to be able to, um, you know, to fight the colonizer. Similarly, uh, Algeria, similarly, Syria, um, you know, and Lebanon. So that's why you see they had this very strong kind of uh, idea of national solidarity. National Egypt, for example, is known for very strong nationalism in the Middle East. Uh, Gulf countries didn't have to the similar extent, right? But something like blockade could be seen you know, equally uh, uh, um, a struggle, equal struggle in some ways, you know, you have a country, you're being attacked by most of your neighbors, you have to find new routes, you're separated from your families, you're being attacked on media consistently. Um, that gives you a new model for solidarity. Are you going to look at your cousins from the same tribe who live in Emirat, or are you going to look at your fellow citizens who you may not share a family name with, but you share a similar struggle with? Right, so that's what I said when I meant conflict. Um, conflicts create nations, actually. Thank you, Zafra, and and it, it reminds me a bit of uh, the theory of nationalism by Ernest Gellner, and that that came to my head for a bit. But thank you for your your answers from both our speakers who, who address uh, the political and economic aspects of of, of Qatar, uh, and, and and really wonderfully. And also, it's a delight to have such an engaged audience who's who put forward a whole list of questions that I hope that we managed to cover uh, in this uh, short span of time. So once again, I'd like to thank both our speakers for joining us today uh, and agreeing to speak on, on these different issues on, on Qatar. And that, con that will conclude our webinar for this series. Uh, but we will uh, be taking a short break and we'll be coming back in two Fridays time to, to look at the culture of cultural sport and tradition of falconry. So that is something that will probably interest our audience because that's something related to the Gulf. And, and also we, we take a break a bit from politics and economics. Uh, so thank you again to our audience and thank you to our two speakers and, and we hope to see you soon and stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Masa. Masa.